Father, we want to thank you for a beautiful Sabbath and an opportunity that you give us this morning to come together to worship you, to learn more about you, to, and to experience the freedom that comes from living a life with you. We ask that you will bless us today, and we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. There are many great speeches that have defined American history. I'm going to share with you the words of some of those speeches, and I'm going to invite you from time to time to participate by filling in the blank, because I have a feeling that many of you will know the words that fit in those blanks. Then I'm going to ask you if you know who gave that speech, and I may share with you when and where it took place. Here is the first one. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are what? Created equal. Well done. Who gave that speech? Abraham Lincoln. Excellent. It's often referred to as the Gettysburg Address, which was delivered in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania on November 19, 1863. Good job. Here's the second one. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Very good. Who said those words? That was Patrick Henry. That was a speech that he made to the Second Virginia Convention in March or on March 23rd, 1775. And it was largely due to that speech that Virginian troops joined the Revolutionary War. Powerful message. Here comes our third one. 2,000 years ago, the proudest boast was Civis Romanus Sum. Okay. Who knows Latin? Civis Romanus Sum. What does that mean? Anybody know? What is Sum? I am. Good. Civis Romanus. I am a Roman citizen. I am a Roman citizen. 2,000 years ago, the proudest boast was Civis Romanus Sum. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is Ish bin ein Berliner. Very good. I heard it back there. Ish bin ein Berliner. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ish bin ein Berliner. Who spoke those words? John F. Kennedy spoke those words. Where was he? He was in Berlin. He was in West Berlin. Those are probably, that's probably one of the best known speeches of the Cold War, and it's one of the most powerful ever given in the world, ever, one of the most powerful anti communist speeches ever given. Now, he was speaking German, it was not his native tongue, and his intent in saying, Ich bin ein Berliner, was to say, I am a citizen of Berlin. He got it off ever so slightly. And in actuality, what he told the world was, I am a jelly-filled donut. <laughs> but he gave it a fair try. And so that speech has indeed gone down in history as a very memorable speech. <clears throat> Here we go, another one. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the empire of Japan. That's right. Who gave that speech? That was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was the 32nd president of the United States to a joint session of Congress on the following day, December 8th, 1941. On December 7th, Japan had attacked 
American bases in Pearl Harbor, and where else, do you know? And the Philippines. The Philippines often gets overlooked, but it was attacked as well. Last one. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. And when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, what? Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Who spoke those words? Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. That was during a march on Washington, D.C., August 28, 1963. Some have argued, and perhaps they're right, that that's the greatest and most well-known speech in American history. It is powerful. Powerful. And it deals with freedom. Freedom. King paints a picture in that speech of an integrated and unified America for his audience. You know, God also desires that for his children. For all of us. Every last one of us. He wants us to be free, and he wants us to be united. How many of you want that too? He wants us to be free and to be united. You know, as we've been together for the last three weeks, we've talked about the Christian walk, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to, to experience freedom in Christ. And last time we were together, we talked about those three steps, three phases, if you will, of the Christian walk. They were big churchy words. Do you remember those churchy words? The first one was justification. The second one was sanctification, and the third one was glorification, justification. What does justification mean? Justification describes when a person accepts Jesus as their personal Savior. Justification frees us from the penalty of sin. What does it do? Justification frees us from the penalty of sin. The second step is sanctification. Sanctification, it has been said, is a lifelong process. As we allow Jesus to change our hearts, to change our lives, to change the way that we live, sanctification frees us from the power of sin. It frees us from what? It frees us from the power of sin. In sanctification, God frees us from the power of sin. The third step was what? Glorification. And glorification is when God frees us from the presence of sin. He frees us from the what? From the presence of sin. So justification, God frees us from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, God frees us from the power of sin. And glorification, God frees us from the presence of sin. We're going to spend a fair bit of time looking at that last part today. Justification, we kind of looked at on our first week together. Sanctification was last week, and we talked about the journey to freedom that many slaves in the South took along the what? Do you remember what they took? The, the Underground Railroad, and it took them to the northern free states, to Canada, sometimes down to, uh, to Mexico as well. A long journey, but for us, the journey to freedom is a much shorter journey. In fact, if you remember last week, how many steps does it take in this journey? Do you remember? Five. Five steps to freedom. You may remember what those are. I'm not going to quiz you this morning, but if you would like to refresh your memory, of course, you can go back and watch that. Or if you don't have that much time or don't want to dedicate that much time to it, you can also check out Doug Pratt's uh, sermon notes. How many of you have seen Doug Pratt's sermon notes? Okay, if you have never seen his sermon notes, you are missing out on something. Amen? They're easy to understand. They're powerful. You can find them at notesforlearning.com. 
notesforlearning.com. He has a very unique way of taking sermon notes that are easy to understand and easy to remember. So you can find his notes on my previous two sermons at that website, notesforlearning.com. So, freedom. During our children's story this morning, you heard a reference to a verse which is very powerful in the Christian walk. It's John 8, verse 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth will what? Make you free. The truth can make us free. What does is, what is the truth make us free from or set us free from? Name me some things that sets us free from. Addictions. Can the truth set us free from addictions, yes or no? Yes, absolutely. What else can the truth set us free from? Sin. Very good. What else can it set us free from? Guilt, right? Anything else? Fear. Deceptions. The truth can set us free from all these things if we will learn the truth, if we will embrace the truth, if we will walk in the truth. Jesus can set us free from all these things. I want you to turn with me to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. We're going to take a look at verses 18 and 19. These are some words that Jesus spoke. So if you happen to have one of those fancy schmancy red letter Bibles, you'll notice that these words are in red. Jesus spoke these words. We're in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. What did Jesus come to do? Here he quotes uh, from elsewhere in the Bible in Isaiah 49 and 61, especially Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. He quotes here in, in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the what? Gospel. What's another word for the gospel? It is the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim what? Liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So Jesus came to bring freedom. He came to bring liberty. He doesn't want us to continue living this life feeling all the guilt, all the pain, all the sorrow, all the the disheartening feelings, the downtrodden uh, experiences from knowing that the devil has the upper hand on us. The good news is, last time I checked, Jesus is more powerful than the devil, amen? So we need to remember that, that the devil is already a defeated foe. So when he's out there trying to needle you and prod you and get you to do the wrong thing and say the wrong thing and give up and, and act like your, your ankle is tied to that stake in the ground, just remember, Jesus is a little more powerful than that rope and that stake. Amen? So he can set you free. In John 8, 30, 8 verse 36, it says, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be what? Free indeed. If the Son makes you free you shall be free indeed. Now, I want to try to illustrate this this morning. And for this illustration, I'm going to need a volunteer. Now, some of you were here last week when I asked for volunteers. I fully expect to get more hands in the air this week because of last week's invitation or or experience. So, I need a volunteer, preferably of of a male variety. Any volunteers? I see a few hands over here, a hand over here. You don't have to be young this time. You could be, but you don't have to be. Um, Let's see. Decisions, decisions, decisions. I'm going to invite you. Come on right up. Yep. All right. So, let's see if we can do a little illustration here. Now, I've got two bits of bad news for you this morning. The first bit of bad news is that this is not the same illustration as last week. All right? So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something here. We're both going to do something together. Are you ready? So, put this on your wrist. I'm going to tighten that up. Put this on your wrist. I'm going to tighten that one up. Now, I'm going to tighten this up on my wrists as well. All right, put yours out like that. Make sure that we are together. Okay, so the first bit of bad news was that this is not the same illustration as last week, right? The second bit of bad news is that this, in, in this illustration, you get to pretend you're the devil. <laughs> you think you can do that? 
But let's make a face out here. What, do you, what kind of face do you think the devil would make if he had somebody in his power? What kind of face would he make? What kind of face? If, that, that's a good face. Make that face out this way. Look. Okay, so he's the devil, but do you know who I am? I'm a sinner. Ooh, I'll, I'll get, let's get some more. Mm, all right. So I'm the sinner. Does it, he, does it look like he's got me in his power here? Looks like I'm bound to him. Like, can we get out of this? We're not getting out of this, are we? It's pretty good. Now, how about if I, here, hold your arms out like that. I'm going to try to, can I get out this way? There's no, he, he's got me, doesn't he? Yes or no? All right. But what, what verse did we just read? He's still trying to get loose. I don't know why he's trying to get loose. I'm the sinner. He should be wanting to hold me, right? So give, give another look out here that says, I've got this guy. Give, give a facial. There we go. All right. All right. So, he has me. But there's something that he doesn't realize. What he doesn't realize is that I have something too. Do you know what I have? I have Christ. And if I have Christ, then guess what? Even though it looks like he has me, if I have Christ, <laughs> he's trying to give me again. Look at that. He's enjoying this just a little too much, right? But look at that. I'm free. I'm free. How did I do that? He's devil's wondering how I did that, right? I'll tell you what. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you keep this, and after the service, if you want, I'll show you how I did that. Does that sound fair? And some of you, if you want to know how I did that too, you come by, grab him, say, hey, bring those ropes, and Eric's going to show us how he did that. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Did he do a good job? He did a fantastic job. Fantastic job. So if we have Christ even though it looks like we are in bondage, we are actually what? We are free. Don't forget that. Turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Here we go. Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, we're going to look at verses 20 through 23. Romans chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. Romans 6, beginning in verse number 20. We spent a fair bit of time in the book of Romans chapter 6. And we are looking at Romans 6, verse number 20. Romans 6, verse number 20. It says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were what? Free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is what? Is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness, or some versions say righteousness, and in the end, what? Everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but God gives us a gift how many of you remember that illustration of the gift last week, right? But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what happens when we have that gift? What does that inspire us to do? Let's take a look over at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, we're going to look at chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to look together at verses 7 and 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Paul recognized that Christ had given him everything that he needed. That he was victorious in Christ. And since he was victorious in Christ, he was looking forward to something. He'd experienced justification, he'd experienced sanctification, and he was looking forward to what? glorification. Take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Verse 7. This is often referred to as Paul's valedictory. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. He says, I have fought the good fight. 
How did he fight that fight? Did he fight it in his own power? No. Nope. Who fought that fight for him? Christ did. He gave the battle over to Christ. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of what? Righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his what? His appearing. He was looking forward to that day when Jesus would come when his body would be glorified, when every trace and taint of sin would be gone, and he would be caught up to meet Jesus in the air. What was he looking forward to? Turn over to Revelation 22. Revelation chapter 22. We're going to look together at Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 14. If you ever want an encouraging Bible study, I've recommended this before, I'll continue to recommend it. If you want an encouraging time in your Bible, read the last two chapters of your Bible. Because the last two chapters of your Bible talk about what this earth is going to be like once sin is gone and no more. Sin is finished by the time you get to Revelation 21. So we're in Revelation chapter 22, and look at verse number 14. How does John describe those who inherit the glories of eternal life? Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. He says, blessed are those who do what? Do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Who is it that has right to the tree of life? Who is it that enters the gates into the city? Those who what? Do his commandments. Now, just to pause and again clarify something here so as not to be misunderstood. Are we saved by keeping the commandments, yes or no? No, absolutely not. We know that Paul says in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 that we are saved by grace through faith in who? In Christ. That's how people are saved. But... If we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, should that, uh, should that affect the way that we live our lives, yes or no? Yes. So we don't keep the commandments in order to be saved. We keep the commandments because we are saved. We just can't help it. God is so good to us. He's so, so loving. He's so forgiving that we, just, we want to express our gratefulness to Him. And the way that we can do that is he, Jesus says, if you love me, do what? keep my commandments. So we say, well, Lord, we love you, so we're going to do what you ask by your grace and by your power. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Into the city, that's that part of that glorification process. When Jesus comes and he catches us up to meet him in the clouds, we are changed we are changed. We are delivered from the presence of sin. What does that change look like? Turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 55. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 55. Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be what? Changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, how? Incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? You know, the good news is, when Jesus comes back, all that stuff is gone. How many of you would like to see that sooner rather than later? Right? All that stuff is gone. All that stuff is in the rearview mirror. All that stuff is in the past. It is past tense. We get to experience that glorification. Now, 
Where else is this described? There's another powerful passage in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Flip over there. 1 Thessalonians. We're going to look at chapter 4. And together we're looking at verses 15 through 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15. It says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Now, when he talks about people who are asleep, what's, who's he talking about? He's talking about the dead, right? Verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will do what? Rise first. Then he says, we who are alive and remain. How many of you would be, um, like to be among those who are alive and remain at the coming of Jesus? Right? That's us. He's talking about us right here. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. When we are with the Lord... Throughout eternity, will there be any more sin? Will there be any more sadness? Will there be any more pain? Any more disappointment? Throughout eternity, we're not going to have to deal with that. See, Jesus wants us to not have to deal with it. Today, we do. Today, it's part of our experience. But it's not God's desire. How many of you are enjoying this quarter's Sabbath school lesson? If you have not been following along with it, it's powerful. What's it talking about in a nutshell? What's it talking about? It's talking about suffering. Why do Christians suffer? And there are several reasons that God allows Christians to suffer. Sometimes we think, well, I, just, I wish I didn't have to suffer at all. Is there ever anything good that comes from suffering, yes or no? Yes. In fact, there are some, some very powerful things that come from suffering. Right now, God is working our character. He's transforming our character. He's changing us. He's shaping us. But there's going to come a day when all that dross is worked out, when all those impurities are gone. When every person that you see, every individual that you come in contact with is not going to have any trace of sin, no trace of evil, no trace of selfishness, would you like to surround yourself with people like that, yes or no? Yeah, God says, that's my plan. One day, we're not going to have to worry about those things anymore. Right now, do we still have to worry about it, yes or no? Yeah, we do. But one day we won't anymore. And that day you see when you get to Revelation 21 and Revelation 22. A day when sin and sinners are no more. God wants to save as many people as possible. And does he make it possible for everybody to be saved? Yes or no? Yes. So why aren't some people, why are some people not saved? Well, choice. Choices. We get to choose which way we want to go. Do we want to be a slave, a servant of sin that leads to death? Or a servant of righteousness that leads to what? Everlasting life. He says you get to choose. That's what this life is all about. It's about choices. Choosing to walk with God or to walk away from Him. To embrace Him or to reject Him. We get to choose whether we want to remain bound to the devil or if we want to be free. And if we choose freedom, will God grant us that, yes or no? Yes, He will. We just have to decide if it's something that we want. The good news is, ultimately, in the flames of hell, God is going to blot out every trace of sin. All the sinners who have chosen to embrace the sin will be engulfed with the sin that they have chosen to embrace. And you know who's probably going to be the last one to disappear is who? Satan himself. He'll be the last one to go. But then the Bible says in Nahum 1 verse 9, and this is a powerful passage, Nahum 1 verse 9, it says, Affliction 
will not rise up a second time. Affliction will not rise up a second time. We won't have to worry about it anymore. Flip over to Revelation. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. We're going to look at verse 4. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. It says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor what? Crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. All those things are going to finally be gone. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, it says that the last enemy that will be destroyed is what? Death. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. That's not too terribly far away in the grand scheme of things. We know it's at least a thousand years from now, but those thousand years, if we're on the right side of things, will be a fairly positive thousand years. Amen? But one day, all that's going to be gone, and the last enemy that's going to be destroyed is death. I want to share a story with you as we kind of draw things together here. Now, you've heard me speak, many of you, a few times, and you already know what type of stories I like, so I'm not going to ask you. Because I had someone tell me recently that I ask that all the time. And everybody already knows the answer to what kind of stories you like. They know you like true stories. So don't ask them anymore. And don't tell them anymore. So I'm not going to tell you that this story that I'm going to close with is a true story. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to tell you that it's an untrue story. But that's untrue. <laughs> Work it through later, you'll get it. In 1843, a 21-year-old Massachusetts scholar by the name of Mellon Chamberlain was doing research on the American Revolution. And as part of his research to find out what prompted those soldiers who served in the American Revolution, what prompted them to, to take up arms? What prompted them to fight against England? Why did they, why did they do what they did? It was many years removed now, and quite honestly, many of the men who had fought in the Revolutionary War were dead, but there were some of them who were still around, and he managed to find a retired soldier, an old fella, I think 91 years old, by the name of Captain Levi Preston. He was a Yankee who was 70 years the senior of this, little, this young historian, Mellon Chamberlain. He had fought at both Lexington and Concord. And so the young man began the interview. He said, Captain Preston, what made you go to fight? What made you go to the Concord fight on April 19th, 1775? What made you go? What did I go for? The old soldier, 91 years old, bowed over in age. He raised himself to his full height. He was kind of taken aback that somebody would ask him a question like that. What, what did you go to fight for? Young man tried again. He says, yeah, my histories tell me that you men of the revolution took up arms against intolerable oppressions. What were they? What were those intolerable, intolerable oppressions? Preston said, oppressions? I didn't feel them. And Chamberlain said, well, what, weren't you oppressed by the Stamp Act? And the old soldier said, I never saw one of those stamps certainly never paid a penny for him. Chamberlain said, well, 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 what about the tea tax? He said, tea tax? Never drank a drop of the stuff. As far as I know, the boys threw it all overboard. <laughs> Chamberlain 
pressed on. He said, well, then I suppose you'd been reading Harrington or Sidney and Locke about the eternal principles of liberty. Preston said, never heard of them. We read the Bible, the Catechism. We read Watts' Psalms and Hymns, and we read the Almanac. And Preston said, well, well, then what was the matter? And what did you mean in going to the fight? Young man, Captain Preston stated firmly, what we meant in going for those redcoats was this. We always had been free, and we meant to be free always, and they didn't mean that we should. Why did we fight? We fought for freedom. Is freedom worth fighting for? Yes, it is. Especially if it's freedom in Christ. It's well worth the fight. And if you want to win that fight, it's actually real easy. The best way to win that fight for freedom is by surrendering. You just surrender to Jesus, and then the fight's not yours anymore. The fight's his, and he'll win it every single time. I shared with you at the outset of this morning's message some quotes from very famous speeches in U.S. history. I want to bring things to a close with a quote from a book. It's the very last paragraph in a book. It's a powerful book, and this is a powerful paragraph. And it really pulls together everything that we've been talking about over the last three Sabbaths. It's found on page 678 of a book called The Great Controversy. Here's the last paragraph. The Great Controversy is ended. What is that great controversy? That's the, that's the struggle, the battle, the strife between righteousness and wickedness between truth and error, between Christ and Satan. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. Is he? Yes, he is. And he loves you enough to offer you eternal life, to offer you freedom in Christ. And he also respects you enough to honor your decision. This morning when you came in, you received a card. I'm going to invite you to pull that card out right now. And each one of us, regardless of whether this is our first time here or you come here on a regular basis or you're just visiting today or you're young or you're old, there's something that you can fill out on this card. So I'm going to invite you to pull that card out and pull out a writing utensil or if you don't happen to, find, to have one, perhaps the person who is to your left or your right will care enough about you that they can lend you one. I'm going to invite you to fill out that bottom portion of the card there. It has your name, address, telephone, email. Fill that out if you would be so kind. And then we're going to go through this card together. As God gives us an opportunity to choose freedom, to choose life, to choose to be on the right side of the great controversy at the very end. And again, if you don't have one of these cards, I want to make sure that you have one. Just raise your hand. We'll make sure that one is brought to you. But let's go through this card together. I have my own pen up here, and so I'm going to do exactly the same thing. The first box there says, I believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God 
and that he is more powerful than the devil. Do you believe that? If you believe that he is the divine son of God and he's more powerful than the devil, then put, a, put an X or a check mark in that first box if you would. The second box says, I am grateful that Jesus offers his children the strength they need to choose him and his way of life. Are you grateful for that? That he gives you that opportunity? If you're grateful for that, put a check mark in that second box. Third one says, I ask Jesus to give me victory in a specific area of my life. If there's something that you've been dealing with, struggling with, that you just want to say, Lord, I'm going to give this one to you today. I want to be free from that. I want you to fight that battle. Then put a check mark in that box. And the very final box there says, I have some questions that I would like to discuss. Maybe you heard something during this series of messages that prompted a question in your mind. Maybe you've got some other biblical questions that have been bothering you. And you'd like to talk with me or with someone else about that, ask those questions, try to find some answers, satisfactory answers. Then you can put a check mark in that fourth box. So the first one, I believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God, that He is more powerful than the devil. Second one, I'm grateful that Jesus offers His children the strength they need to choose Him and His way of life. Third, I ask Jesus to give me victory in a specific area of my life. And finally, number four, I have some questions that I would like to discuss. What I'm going to do is I'm going to invite our orchestra to come out. They're going to get prepared for our final hymn, our closing hymn. But as they're doing that, what I'd like to invite you to do is take that card and pass it to the nearest aisle. It doesn't matter which aisle, whichever one's closest to you. Pass it to the nearest aisle. We're going to have some of our ushers come through, and they're going to collect that card. And as they do that, we are going to have a prayer, a prayer that God will bless us. Feel free, just pass those cards to the nearest aisle. They will be happy to collect them. We're going to pray that God will bless us, will help us to experience freedom in Christ. And not just that we would experience that freedom in Christ, but also that as we experience that freedom in Christ, people would see the change in our lives and would be impressed to learn more about the one who has changed our lives. That's that change in character that takes place. When we invite Jesus to come in and change our lives, people will notice and they'll want to know what's made you different. So by the grace of God, as we make these decisions, those decisions won't just stop at us, but they will flow far and wide. And by the grace of God, His kingdom will be increased. Amen? So let's have a closing prayer. Then our musicians, our orchestra is going to come out. We're going to have our final song, which if you've been here the last two weeks, you could probably guess what our final song is going to be this week. And then I believe that there is lunch being served, so you are invited heartily to come and join us for that. Let's pray as we close this morning's service. Father, we want to thank you for offering us freedom. We don't have to be bound to the adversary. We can be free. And you make that very possible. So we ask that you would work on our hearts, touch our hearts, and help us to choose freedom. Help us to choose Jesus. Ultimately, help us to choose life. And that only comes by choosing you. So grant us strength, grant us courage, and grant us a daily walk with you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.